Thank you, guys, and thanks to those that are going to be watching at home and seeing this streaming. Uh, Gary Shapiro is the president and CEO of the Consumer Electronics Association. We are all here guests at the biggest party uh, of the year. Uh, my name is Brent Weinstein. I am head of digital media at United Talent Agency, and we're blessed to be working with CEA and Gary and have for the past few years. And we're here to talk with Gary not only about the show, which has grown and expanded and morphed and innovated so much over the past few years, but also his book, Ninja Innovation, which details uh, many aspects of what true innovators do and draws parallels to the life of Ninja. Uh, so first, Gary, thanks for being here. Brent, thank you for uh, everything you do and being here. You kind of make me feel cool. Oh, thank you very much. Uh, that's sad. <laughs> uh, let's, before we get into the book, let's talk about the show. Um, so much of what this book is about, so much of what your previous book is about, is about innovation, entrepreneurialism. The show has been around forever, and yet each year, but really it feels like in the past few years, the show itself has innovated. You haven't rested on your laurels. The show isn't the same experience that it was a few years ago. This year, in particular, there's a number of new programs. Even you know, the look and feel of the show has changed. Maybe talk a little bit about how you as a leader have had to innovate your business. Well, the show, of course, is about innovation. In fact, almost any show or conference or meeting in the world is about innovation because if there was no changes, there'd be no point in going and seeing, otherwise you're seeing the same old stuff. Um, it's like reading the same book over and over again, which actually some people do. Uh, but in the last chapter of Ninja Innovation, I talked about our strategy with this event, which we developed over a dozen years ago. We figured out if we were just focused on retailers, the number of retailers that control a large portion of the market would fit on all these chairs here and then there's some chairs left over. So we said we really have to expand the scope of the show. So our strategy was to make it an international event and expand the definition of what consumer electronics is. And you know, fortunately for us, consumer electronics and innovation occurred and we, now consumer electronics includes cars. Nine of the ten largest car companies are exhibiting here. It includes robotics, drones, wireless technology, uh, wireless healthcare. It includes 3D printing. It includes ultra HD 4K. I mean, so it includes a lot of categories which frankly didn't exist a dozen years ago. And when we looked at our own statistics just a few weeks ago, we said every year we release data projecting sales for the next year, for 2014. And I asked the question, how much of this is new innovative stuff? And we were shocked the answer that our 2014 sales, $6 billion of it will be new products that didn't exist a few years so ago. So not just iterations of old products, brand new products. Absolutely. 3D printing is, is you could argue, yes, there's been prototyping products there, but this is now a consumer product. Ultra HD did not exist a few years ago, and now it does, and it's a consumer product that people are buying. Um, wireless health. It's, it's, we're at the beginning of a lot of these of gro huge growth stage. Um, you know, we're going in some categories like driverless cars. We're, we're heading to that direction incrementally and we're getting there. These are things which change society, make the human condition better, um, improve agriculture, health, things like that. So what turns us on as, as a group, frankly, and as an industry is we're making the world different. And that's all about innovation. And my view of the world, which was in my first book, is that innovation should be our national strategy. That's what we should focus on. That's what we're good at for a whole variety of reasons. Um, the show itself is just a reflection of 3,200 companies showing their coolest, most innovative stuff. And I haven't invented any of it, and I'm reluctant to claim credit for it, but we do have a strategy that's laid out in Ninja Innovation about every show must be different, we must have several things that are different. We really did bite off a lot this year because we changed just about every contractor involving the show. Not you, of course. Not us. <laughs> The people who do the, the general contracting uh, is now Freeman, and they're doing a phenomenal job. We changed the, the way we do badging, so it's, it's more efficient, it's more green. Uh, we, we changed so many different things about the show. It seems not only has the show grown in terms of the product categories, and you're right, I feel like things like wearable technology and the Internet of Things and, uh, and health, we're at the very early stages. We're in chapter one of those books, um, and I think those are going to be much bigger uh, at, at future shows. Uh, but you've also brought in the tent, and there's so many people here from the advertising business and from the media business. Uh, it, it seems to me that there are as many chief marketing officers here at CES as there are chief technology officers. That's absolutely true, and, and you stated it very well. So it's not only 
one industry. We try to make this the convergence for every industry that's touched by innovation and consumer technology. So yes, Madison Avenue here is here, Hollywood is here, Wall Street is here, uh, Silicon Valley is here, and, and their counterparts from around the world. And they want to be here in part to meet each other, in part to have their own little verticals, but in part because they get to see the future here. They get to see the technology they're going to be dealing with soon. And they're going to get, it's also what I love about this show is it's inspiring. There's the serendipitous moments that you have here. Everyone I talk to leaves the show charged up. I mean, they're exhausted and charged up, but they have ideas for the future. They've established business relationships. You know, the only people I have trouble with are the people who say, oh, I'm going to Vegas and I'll be in a meeting room and I'll not leave it for four days in my hotel, and that's the way, to, you know, I never actually go to the show. I think you have an obligation yourself to explore and open yourself up to new things. It may be uncomfortable, it may be difficult, and you have to open your mind, but you will not grow as an individual, you will not grow your business or as a company unless you are out there trying something new. Because the reality of the competitive marketplace today is every business is out there and you can't look at the landscape today and say I'm competing with that landscape. You're competing with a future landscape and everyone else is out there thinking of the possibilities in the future. You have to be agile today. You have to be a ninja today. That's what you must be. And to be a ninja, you have to have a lot of skills that are, as you know, Wayne Gretzky says, you have to go to where you, you shoot the puck to your player where he's going, not where he is. So, you know, one of the most exciting aspects of the show for me, and I know it's close to your heart as well, is Eureka Park, which is something that's new. And when we think about innovation, um, there's a lot of innovation in the main halls. There's also a lot of iteration. But in Eureka Park, it's pure innovation. It's companies and products that just didn't exist uh, maybe six months ago. And companies that maybe never would have had an opportunity to take advantage of this type of platform, this type of stage, were it not for you know, your team's uh, willingness to create that opportunity. It feels like every year that's gotten bigger and we're starting to see people move from Eureka Park into the main show, which I imagine is really rewarding for you. Absolutely, and this goes out to the tradition. Over 30 years ago, when I attended my first board meeting of the association that owns this show, which is a nonprofit organization, the debate was about raising how much it costs to exhibit here. And the largest exhibitors were, were debating it, but they all agreed. They said, it doesn't matter to us. This is not the cost is exhibiting, because we have to build booths. We have to bring people we entertain, and the space is irrelevant. It's a the rounding error. The carpet's error. the cheap part. Right, it's the rounding error. Um, but we have to make this show so that anyone with an idea can expose it to literally thousands of investors, partners, retailers, buyers from around the world. And in fact, our volunteer leadership are those that have done just that. We had a Kathy Gornick of Teal who tells a story to our staff how she packed lunches and food for four days with one prototype product. And with the order she got, she financed the manufacturing of that. And we have Lloyd Ivey of MTX who lived in a car for four days. He became our chairman. And others like that have worked their way up through the CES. Last night we heard the story of uh, Bree Pettis of um, MakerBot, the first 3D printer. He was given free space at 10 by 10 at the back of the hall. And he was talking about that last night. It's amazing. He won a contest that we had five years ago. And now we just sold his company for a few hundred million dollars and he's the dominant player in this 3D marketplace where there's over 30 companies now exhibiting. But that's what this show is about. Is anyone with an idea should be allowed to expose it. And that's what motivates our staff. And that has the support of the largest exhibitors who really finance the show. Eureka Park was just a crazy idea. We partnered with the National Science Foundation and Startup America. We said, let's go after the real startups. I mean, they really wouldn't even think about being in a show and let's subsidize their participation and expose them. And we, our goal was 30 companies. We hit like 60. And this is the third time we're over 200 companies. There's a Eureka Park 2 for graduates. And now it is the buzz area of the show because there are people there with phenomenal ideas. I was talking with these, this woman uh, from Croatia this morning who has a, a product in Eureka Park. It's a bear that kids squeeze in the hospital when they're sick and it monitors all their vital signs and it gets that information out. That's so amazing. It's, it is. It's, a, it's, like, it's a phenomenal idea solving a real problem about you know, kids that are in a bad situation and helping them out. And it's taking, putting together components of things that are available in a very clever way. And, they're entrepre and, and I said, how's it going? And she said, it's overwhelming. It is fantastic. And, and every Eureka Park company I talk to says the same thing. A lot of them are really not prepared for the amount of inquiries in business. Some of them are even have business cards ready to go. 
but they get feedback, and then they change their business plan on the basis of the feedback, or they get acquired. Mark Cuban was walking around the Eureka Park, and apparently he agreed to finance a company for a few million dollars. That's so amazing. It's great stories like these that, that make the show exciting and successful, and it, it really jazzes up the staff here, because we're excited and passionate about innovation and what we do to bring people in different industries together. You helped connect us to Hollywood. I mean, the content world is here um, in so many different ways. It's not only Hollywood, it's the you know, tonight we have an award ceremony for really cool stuff. Who would have thought of that just five years ago? It's, uh, it's been amazing to see it grow. I think Eureka Park and all of this, it's, it, it's an interesting segue to some of the things you talk about in your book, some of the aspects of ninja innovation, taking risk and, uh, uh, and being disruptive. Years ago, back at the Sands, there was a small booth. It was maybe a 10 by 10, maybe, and there was this little company called Slingbox there. And I remember seeing it and thinking, wow, this is really interesting. This solves a problem that I have. This is before there was a lot of real penetration with broadband. I wanted to watch my shows when I was traveling. And I thought, wow, this thing called Slingbox is pretty cool. It's obviously since become a standard. It was bought by, uh, by Dish and Echo Star. And that company now not only has a lot of space on the show floor, but there's a big space devoted to Sling. But some of the most innovative products, which are scaring the heck out of a lot of people, are coming from Dish and Echo Star. A Dish Hopper won you know, the product of the year at this show last year. And I think if you talk to anybody out there, no one's watching commercials. Everyone knows that, that that's something that has to be solved for. They actually just built a problem that gave people what they want, and it's scaring people. Um, I think Arrow um, is another company that is also, uh, you know, trying to find a little gray area to exploit about how television is transmitted to the home. What do you think that, you know, you've always taken the position that the market should be as free as possible and that we should just get out of the way. Do you think that we'll, that these companies will be allowed to continue to innovate and do you think that things like Arrow are uh, going to pave the way for other companies to deconstruct models, or do you think that it's just too dangerous? Well, I began my career fighting for the legality of the video cassette recorder. Hollywood said it would destroy them, and obviously it didn't. It enhanced them and multiplied their revenue, gave them new revenue streams. I believe that technology has to find its own path. It was only it was a five to four vote of the United States Supreme Court. One person, actually, the VCR could have been illegal in a whole path of products, including the personal video recorder then would have been illegal. And where would we be without our TiVos and other great products? I mean, life would be different. And I think life is better. And the content world has adjusted. There's, no, there's a lot more content creation today than there was 20 or 30 years ago. And even in the music world, with the music people said, you know, recording's gonna kill us and all that. And there's certain lines that society has to draw. Obviously, selling someone else's product is your own and making money on a commercial piracy is immoral, unethical, and should be illegal. But what you do in your own home and what you could do with technology, I think you should be okay on. And I think new, new paths rise. And the bigger issue is that there's always new technology and innovation is going to come, and it's going to threaten the status quo. Let's go outside of consumer technology. Let's talk about Uber, which is a member of our association. Uber is a product which totally challenges the concept of taxi cab monopolies. You know, in the Washington, D.C. area, we have the worst taxi cabs probably in the United States. I mean, they're, they're horrible, they're unair-conditioned, they rip you off, and, and if you don't want a cab, until a few years ago, the only choice you had was a limo, three-hour minimum, a few hundred dollars. Not affordable for a nonprofit, that's for sure. So what do you do on a hot 98-degree summer day and you're in a business suit and you have to go testify in Congress? And there's no parking in D.C. There was no choice. Uber came along and it was a godsend. You know, you could be anywhere you want. You can get someone quick. You rate each other. It's actually air-conditioned and clean, and, and they're polite. Unbelievable. Well, the first Uber driver was arrested in Washington, D.C. Why? The cabs, try, and they're still trying to shut them down. Some cities are not allowed. That is a disruptive innovator. And what do they have? They have basically an algorithm and a smart way of allocating a scarce resource, or actually a resource which is just sitting idle limousine drivers. And it's good for the environment. It's good for everybody. Everybody wins. And there's all sorts of, and right now at this show, there's a kind of a Uber counterpart that I believe Verizon announced just yesterday. I was one of the judges. They announced, uh, won an award. And they're helping manage our taxi lines. What they do is they're getting seats. They combine people to a similar destination within a period of time and take a cheaper cab together. And the cab driver actually makes more money. 
my point is that through technology, there are all sorts of better ways of doing things in society. And many, if not all of them, disrupt existing businesses. But you know, so what? That's America. What makes us strong as a nation is that we're entrepreneurial, we're innovative, and we're willing to accept the fact that existing business models should not be protected by government. We have a First Amendment, which allows us to do things and to say what we want, and the government will not smash us down, including new business models. We have a relatively open political process where if you're just trying to protect the incumbents, some journalists can out you for that. The money that's flowing will be outed. We have a a society and a culture where people disagree and challenge the status quo. We are a group of that we are the most diverse, heterogeneous society in the world. So we don't all just agree with each other, we disagree. We grow up with Kool-Aid stands we, and lemonade stands and things like that where kids start things. In the schools, our kids ask why and why not. They don't memorize rote very well and we don't do great on standardized tests, but what we do do is we push the status quo and that's why we should be an innovative country. And that's why this event exists and that's why it's a great country to be innovative. We have every major internet company is a U.S. company. We have the chip companies. We have com great companies like Apple and Qualcomm and Amazon. TI and HP and Amazon and eBay. And I mean, you could go on and on for Foursquare and Wikipedia, I mean, and Twitter. These are U.S. companies. Every, and, and having books, you go around the world and you talk about them. Every country wants to be like the U.S. And they figured out some of the things we've been doing. You know, getting the best and the brightest, uh, focusing on really good high quality education, doing a lot of things right. And right now, today, there's 200,000 Chinese students in the U.S. because China has made a national strategic decision. They want to be like us. And they want those kids to learn how we learn to innovate at younger and younger and younger ages to the point they're sending kids here in elementary school. So let's talk about our green friend right here. So, patent troll. That's a patent troll. So, you know, the, the notion of innovation is complemented by the promise of protection and uh, profitability. That if I, whether I'm an individual working out of my garage or whether I'm a corporate scientist working at Intel, if I come up with something amazing, I should be the one to benefit from it. And then on the other side of that are people who file and file and file for the explicit purpose of hoping that someone else comes along with the same idea who does have deeper pockets and then you litigate. How do we resolve that so that the inventor, you know, I have young kids. Every one of my daughter and her friends, everyone's got a rainbow loom, right? I don't know if you remember these things. It's like these little rubber band bracelets that everyone's making. And this guy is just a dad from Detroit your hometown, who had an idea, made it, and he's literally going to make $100 million, it's something that could very easily be ripped off. How do you protect that guy, but still make sure that you're not creating an environment where the patent trolls stifle innovation? Well, the patent trolling today is legalized extortion. So yesterday we had a press conference and, and a couple of company CEOs were talking about it. And he says, look at this. this one of our, our uh, actually our chairman of our board from New Orleans created a home automation company. And he says, look, I got this letter from this guy. This patent was in his final year. They bought it with six months left. And they took a photocopy at it. And all they did is put the patent number in and send it to thousands of people. And they're basically, you know, somebody bought this old patent. And now what good in society does that do? This is basically, these are lawyers who are, you know, we have more lawyers per person than any country in the world. They're including, including both of us. But we're doing something productive, I like to believe, and we're not extorting people. We're producing wealth and creating jobs and excitement and fun. And I don't write legal demand letters to people that are startups or even big companies uh, because I have bought a piece of paper which is, has some ambiguous language on it. And the way the law is today, it allows people, anyone who's gotten a patent gets... Uh, the, the, the truth is, and we heard this from the Secretary of Commerce yesterday, interviewer, what she said very clearly was the Patent Trademark Office, which is under her, in prior years was rather promiscuous. She didn't use that word, I am. But they granted a lot of patents very broadly they shouldn't have. And now people are buying these very broad claims, like for a shopping cart, for example, on a website. And they go out, they, they photocopy thousands of letters and send them to everyone, and they'll keep extorting companies until they settle for maybe 5,000, 10,000, 100,000, because they know the cost of litigation is like over a million dollars. So what do you do? Well. Um, the House of Representatives, which is considered very partisan, has passed a bipartisan bill overwhelmingly saying, here are the rules. If you want to exert your patent rights, 
You have to say what it is, what you're claiming, and if there's litigation, and if it's, it's not, and you lose, maybe you'll have to pay the other side's fees. So there's all sorts of ways of mitigating extortion, legalized extortion, which is what's going on. So what we're doing with, with, pat, with, le, with uh, patent trolls, you're taking away basically a lot of, if you're a startup company and you get a letter from a patent troll, your funding dries up, you fire everyone in your staff and you go out of business. You have no shot at it. If you're even a, a company beyond the startup phase and you, you have revenue, all of a sudden you get a patent troll letter, the CEO's time, the top engineer's time, you have to hire lawyers, you have to research these things. It's draining. It is a waste of societal resources. It's a moral crime in my view, and it has to stop. And I think that's why we saw it bipartisan. President Obama has spoken out about it. See, think about it. What other issue in the business world has President Obama spoken out about? This is the one, because he knows, he's heard from millions of American businesses that this is killing them and doing nothing for society. Yet you're right, if you create a patent, you must be able to exploit that patent. And you better have a good, strong patent, but that, the law will protect that as well. So for people who maybe haven't seen your previous talks this week, it's been passed in the House. Where is it in terms of the legislative process? Well, there's, you know, the trial lawyers uh, have more money than God, and the, the people who, who have funded these patents, the patent trolls themselves, and they're throwing money around the Senate. They're trying to hire lobbyists. And they have effectively slowed the process. And the Senate is saying, you know, let's go slowly. And Senator Harry Reid is not a fast guy on anything. And, um, you know, I wish he would come and see the innovation here and understand the issue. But he's not indicated any desire to rush this out of the Senate. And, you know, this is an election year. And who knows what will happen. And, and, and that's the problem with Washington. They are sometimes disconnected from the reality that their decisions and their slowness and their inability to even talk to each other hurt jobs. And that's why I credit the Democrats and the Republicans in the House for doing something about this. And even with President Obama saying this is a priority, the Senate is, in some ways, it's a little sleepy, you know? So back to something more positive, uh, you know, today's day three of the show, tomorrow's day four, and then we, you know, take a break until we reconvene next year. What do you think is going to be the biggest innovation? Who's the ninja that coming out of this show is going to blow people's socks you know, off and we're going to be talking about them next year? Do you have a, what are you excited about? Well, you know, that's the question that every journalist likes to ask me the last two months. And, and I've had difficulty answering it. Finally, the Wall Street Journal figured out my answer, as did a couple others. And, and the, really, the story of the show is not one company. It's the fact that we're in a wave of new innovation in so many different areas. A lot of it is powered by these tiny little products called MEMS, Microelectromechanical Systems. These are the products which are in every uh, smartphone and tablet which sense things. They sense your location. They, se they could sense the temperature. They're accelerometers. They sense the, how fast you're going. But they could also sense the, the, the thickness of your blood or your blood sugar level. And they could sense, like, literally, we're going in thousands of different directions of sensing with these MEMS products, and we have a special area of the show for that. Very clever entrepreneurs and innovators are putting those MEMS products and other chips together in a way which perform useful services, like the, the, these women in Croatia with their, their new company. Um, you could do things that are very creative to solve societal problems. So the story of the show to me is Ultra HD. The story is high performance audio. It's MEMS, it's wireless health, it's, it's wrists. Uh, the area of the wrist where all sorts of new things are being tried. It's wearable technology, as you mentioned earlier. It's robotics and drones. It's automobiles doing incredible things, becoming more safer. It's 3,200 different stories of companies out there. It's the fact that we're at the beginning of this wave of phenomenal innovation because people are thinking outside the box. And instead of the Me Too atmosphere that frankly occupied a lot of the thinking a few years ago, people are saying, you know what? We have to do something different. There are challenges in your employees. And I really believe a lot of this stemmed out of the 2008, 2009 recession, where it was innovate or die was what we were preaching. And I think companies took it to heart. Some of them went out of business. But if you did not innovate, you died. And companies now, I think, are understanding that competition is worldwide, and they just can't replicate what their competitors are doing. They have to go beyond that. They have to try something new. They have to be different. They have to be clever. And they have to be fast. Uh, and that's the bottom line. I think. Samsung, just using uh, an exhibitor that has a big presence here, is a great example of that. Uh, I remember, I can't remember the exact year, I think it was 2006 when the first iPhone was released, but the day before that was released, you talk about stealth in here. No one, everyone thought Apple was working on a phone, but no one knew what it was going to be because you couldn't envision this thing that you had never seen before. 
And up until that moment, there was billions of dollars of R&D being invested in traditional WAP-based phones, and everyone was trying to get on the Verizon deck and Qualcomm, and all these companies were focused on this thing that the next day became completely irrelevant because the smartphone was invented. Uh, Samsung is a really interesting story because at the beginning they said, oh wow, your device kind of looks like an iPhone, but the way that they've innovated and the way they've connected it to the watch and the way they're connecting it to their devices and how their market share has just exploded is really inspiring because they could have just been the alternative to the iPhone and they've really become the preferred choice for many people. Um, and when we look at and study and measure brand perception and brand health and brand dependence, people really love those devices. They have as much affection for Samsung as they do Apple, and I think that's probably something that people wouldn't have suspected in 2007 when Steve Jobs first stood on stage in a turtleneck and showed people the iPhone. That Samsung seems to me like an amazing story of this show and, and, and of what you're talking about. You know, it's, it's true, actually. Samsung is a ninja company, but it goes back at least 20 years. I remember attending a presentation of those where they had a vision and a strategy. They were ninjas. They said, this is where we want to be. They had goals. We want to be number one in these different categories. And, and actually, the truth is, they approached me, and they wanted to keynote at CES. They wanted to be the first Korean company, and we're very careful to do keynotes. And it took four or five years, but once I saw their presentation and their vision, I said, let's give it a shot. And they, they, we had uh, uh, the first Samsung keynote, and they credit that keynote to making them a brand. They were in the cover of every business magazine, and they were out there, and they made their goals, and then they exceeded them. But what they also did as ninjas, which you point out, is it's great to have goals, but once you hit the reality of the marketplace or the reality of the battlefield like a ninja, the whole game plan changes and you have to be flexible. You have to be throw everything away and start over. And you remember that when you set those goals, it was a different environment you were in and the environment has changed. They did that when Apple came along. Look, they saw Apple had some certain weaknesses even in the tablet, you know, Apple didn't have flash. Samsung came along and they saw the weaknesses and they exploited them. And Samsung's an intensely competitive company. They're very competitive with LG, but you know, they raised the stakes, they're competitive with Apple as well. And they, and it's, I always tell entrepreneurs and innovators, you can succeed relatively easy against a big company because it takes a lot for a big company to make a decision. Samsung has actually proven they can decide things fairly quickly. I don't know how they do it, but they have gotten, a, the, the problem in a big company is, you know, someone who's close to the marketplace with an idea has to go up, you know, eight to 15 levels to get approval. Every step of the level along the way, the, re, the incentive is to say no, because you're not going to get in trouble for saying no. You're only going to get in trouble for saying yes and then it flops. It doesn't work. So somehow Samsung is, and I don't pretend to know how they've done this, they have bypassed that product. They're quick, they're fast, they're smart, they're sharp, they're coming to new products. They've gone into all sorts of really cool things and they've made a difference. And they've become fantastic brand marketers, which I think is really important. And that's true, and, and, and that's another great thing about a trade show. So here I am, the biggest advocate for, in, for technology. That's my job. I am a paid employee of CEA, even though all the book sales, the book is owned by the Consumer Electronics Association. But yet, here we are, live face to face in a five cents experience and we're talking to each other looking each other in the eye you guys are looking at me you're looking at the exhibits and you're forming an impression of me forming an impression of the book forming an impression of the brands of the companies here you're figuring out who you want to do business with what you want to do where you want to spend your time and money you can't do that through technology as much as you can in person with five senses so that's the value of this event is you're creating really strong powerful senses of brands and of people, because people are brands as well. Well, I'm getting the note that we are done, so what? thank we you for this. What's going on this here? This is uh, More. an Robert, amazing help book. Me. Everyone, please pick it up. Gary's going to be signing these over at Gary's Book Club, which is about 50 paces that way. Uh, I hope everyone has an amazing time here at the show, and I hope this is uh, you'll be back here this time next year. Thanks.